we're in the third week of a series preparing us for Good Friday and then Easter. And uh, we're doing that by looking at the words of Jesus from the cross. Taking a good look at, at some pretty significant words that he was saying while he was being tortured. Um, we looked th at, the, at the different phases of his torture the first week. We looked at how much blood that he'd lost um, during the flogging process, they called it 40 lashes minus one, just short of killing him. Um, and then the crucifixion itself, it's just horrible. Putting, putting on a cross in such a way that you, you have to lift yourself up in order to breathe. Um, pushing against the nail that's nailed through your feet. I mean, you can just imagine the agony of that. In fact, if they didn't nail your feet onto the cross, you'd just suffocate because you couldn't lift yourself up to breathe. It's just a an agony, agonizing um, way to die. I mean, the Romans, they took, they took pride in the way they tortured people, and, and they were very good at it. And, and the crucifixion was truly the, the ultimate expression, their most proudest moment as, as, a, as a torture um, reserved for the lowest of the low. And yet Jesus is completely innocent, right? And in spite of being in such agony, and it's just amazing to me to think about some of the words that he said, such significant things that he said while he was on there. And I think sometimes we forget just by looking at the words, uh, you know, as we're doing our devotions or whenever, and we're just looking at the words and not really thinking about what it is that he's experiencing when he's saying these things. I mean, the context, I think, is really important. I mean, think about the first week. We saw this, this offer of a prayer to, to the Father for forgiveness for those people who were right at that moment torturing him, right? I mean, how, how hard could that be, really? I mean, Luke 23, 34 is the verse we looked at. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And I mean, Jesus asking forgiveness for those who are just doing just horrible things for them, to, to him, and, and I mean, they aren't deserving forgiveness. They haven't even asked for forgiveness, right? Even after Jesus has, has said this in front of them. And, and yet forgiveness is what Jesus desires. It's more than what he desires. Forgiveness is the very reason he's, he's on the cross, right? He is providing a way to forgiveness. That's the reason why he's there. <laughs> then the last week, we looked at these two criminals hanging on the cross next to them, next to him, those who actually deserved that kind of punishment. Um, we saw them mocking Jesus like everyone else that was there. And yet, by the grace of God that gets hold of one of those criminals, he, he ends up turning, right? He ends up changing his, tone, his tune. He, he ends up actually uh, defending Jesus. It's an incredible turn, <laughs> And he ends up declaring his faith, his hope in Jesus. Luke 23 was the story, but the other criminal rebuked the criminal who was hurling insults at Jesus. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kim kingdom. He's, he's, he's imagining that that. This is not the end of the road for Jesus, right? He's declaring his faith in him. Verse 43, Jesus answers him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, remember where he's at, right? I mean, he would have had to struggle to say that. But he's declaring this hope of salvation to this, to this criminal. Why would he do such a thing? How could he do? I mean... He couldn't, this criminal couldn't even prove that his heart had changed, right? How could he offer that kind of hope to this criminal? And again, this is, this is not the end of the story for the criminal, is it? It's just the beginning of the story. Jesus was on that cross so that he could provide a way to salvation for him. It was why he was up there, so that people like that criminal who would cry out to him for help, he would provide help. Again, it, it's pretty remarkable that Jesus could even speak, much less speak significant words as he's going through this horrible situation. And, and as we move into the part of the story we're going to look at today, um, 
we tend to think that Jesus is, is having this all done to him, which it is. I mean, they're torturing him. They're, they're killing him. But even on the cross, who is really in control, right? Who is really in charge here? Turn, turn with me to John 19 this morning. John 19. John actually provides us a great perspective of this situation. He's pointing out as he's going through the story the many prophecies about the Messiah that is being fulfilled as, as this horrible ordeal is, is winding out. It's, it's very interesting. Let's look at one particular point, point where there's a prophecy being fulfilled, beginning with verse 23. So John 19, verse 23, it says, When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless. It was woven in one piece from top to bon bottom. So it was a little more valuable. And they said, let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Because this one's a little bit better piece of fabric. And this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. So this is what the soldiers did. I mean, it's not, they didn't do it because they knew this, what the scripture said, right? They did it because <laughs> they were a part of the story. And, and the story that was foretold actually came to being through them somehow. And, you know, Jesus hasn't been on that cross all that long. And here these soldiers are. They're, they're divvying up his clothes already. I mean, they're, they're assuming he's dead. And you can see in this picture, it's kind of an interesting picture because you see the feet, right, of Jesus. I mean, they're, 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 it's like they're just doing their, their own thing, um, completely ignoring what's happening, right, what's happening above them. And, and they literally cast lots to determine who might get this expensive, more expensive piece of clothing, um, which again was a seamless undergarment. It is literally Jesus' used underwear. I mean, what would you pay for some used underwear? Our, our, our world is so crazy about things like that, that a celebrity might have used or, or, or wore, or I was just Googling. I, I like to Google. So um, just a few things that people were willing to pay astronomical amounts of money for. Um, um, there, was, there was a chair that J.K. Rowling um, used that sold for $394,000. There was a lock of Justin Bieber's hair. I mean, how much would you pay for that? Um, $40,600. And Britney Spears actually had a chewed up piece of gum. Already been chewed. ABC gum that sold for $14,000. And this is Jesus, right? This is the Messiah, the Son of God. I mean, what would you pay? But these common criminals aren't even thinking about Jesus in that way. He's just a common criminal to them. They care more about that, that piece of clothing than they do about him. It does, he's not a celebrity, right? They're just going through the motions. And yet, in their going through the motions, not even knowing what they're doing, they are fulfilling prophecies <laughs> that were foretold centuries before. Read Psalm 22. I mean, it's amazing. Just this one piece. I'll, you, could re you should read the whole thing because it's just amazing. But verse 16, it says, Dogs surround me. Dogs being the common term that Jews would have called Gentiles or non-Jews. Dogs are surrounding me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. This is a prophecy that was written hundreds of years before Jesus. I mean, it's amazingly accurate, isn't it? Prophecies are being fulfilled in this story. I mean, and it really brings to light this notion of God's sovereignty, of God's will, right? The death of God's Son was, in fact, the will of God the Father. And Jesus is submissive to God's will, right? In fact, he's desiring the same thing as the Father. What, what are they desiring? They're desiring. They're, he's, they're on a mission, aren't they? To save the world. This is a way bigger mission than and a little bit of discomfort on a cross to them. I mean, in the midst of this horrible scene... 
I mean, let's just not lose sight that, that Jesus, as weak as he might look, as, as, as awful as he feels in this situation, he is exactly where he wants to be. He chose this. He wanted this. He wants to save the world, right? And in this passage, we see this remarkable contrast between these soldiers who are just completely focused in on themselves. What can I get for myself, right? How can I get a few bucks? Um, it's as if they're, again, they're not even paying attention to what's going around them. They're not even observing the crowd or, or anything. They're just there trying to get their, get their money from whatever leftover pieces that are from the criminals that were there. And, and then we have Jesus, who is suffering in agony, and yet he is still very much aware of everything going on around him. Very much aware of the needs of the people around him. In fact, I mean, he's still not focused on himself, right? Jesus notices this group of, of people in the crowd below him, and they're a group of observers. And this really kind of sets up the next significant statement that Jesus makes from the cross. Verse 25 of, of John 19. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And again, he wouldn't have said it that way, right? He's on the cross. He's gasping it. So what's happening here? Well, Jesus is actually taking care of the final arrangements of the care of his mother, right? In the middle of this horrible situation, he is suffering terribly. He is worried not about himself, but about his mom, right? I mean, Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, I mean, we haven't seen him mentioned in the New Testament other than the, at least as Jesus as an, as an adult. So he's apparently passed, passed on at this point. And, and as we know with Jewish customs, widows really have a hard time making ends meet. And it comes down to the responsibility of the older son to take care of their mothers. And, and Jesus was the older son, right? And so we have Jesus here on the cross suffering and he's providing basically his last will and testament. Right? What he would like to see happen. What he would like to see how, how his mother was going to be taken care of. And, and so he provides his beloved disciple, John, to be her new son. To take care of her. And she becomes John's new mother. I mean, right here in the middle of a crucifixion, right? Capture this scene. I mean, he can barely breathe, and he's conducting an adoption. I mean, isn't this a crazy scene? Jesus, you're on the cross. You are about to die. You, you're suffering in pain, and yet you're still thinking of other people? Taking care of other people? I mean, it really begs the question for us who are followers of Christ. I mean, how bad does it have to be for us before we could actually start justifying of thinking of ourselves first? Really? I mean, think about it. I mean, we know the commandments. Love God, love, love others. I mean, at what point in our own misery do we get to finally have to worry about us? <laughs> Completely about me, not about others. I mean, aren't I in a bad enough situation that I don't have to worry about other people? I mean, think about it. Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Shouldn't there be a breaking point where we need to take care of me? But this ultimately does come back to our conversation about rest, isn't it? I mean... Jesus trusted God. He trusted that God would take care of him. And because of that trust in God, he knew he was in good hands. He knew that God was sovereignly taking care of him, right? That he became free 
to take care of other people. He became free to put all of his energies towards following God because he knew, he knew God had his back, right? He could, he could focus on loving others. But doesn't that just sound so wrong? <laughs> what about me? I mean, our, our, our world works very, very hard to tell us that this is wrong. You, you have to take care of yourself, right? You got to take care of me. And I believe that God wants us to take care of ourselves. I do. But actually, God's way of taking care of me is totally different than what the world tells us to do to take care of me, right? Right? I mean, taking care of me is not this selfish preoccupation with me, right? Taking care of me really begins and ends with resting in God, doesn't it? That he's going to take care of us? Is he big enough? I mean, is our God big enough to take care of us? That even in the middle of a crucifixion, things are happening, <laughs> And they're exactly the way he said it was going to happen. I mean, can we trust God that much? I mean, think about Jesus' life. How often does he get away from the crowds and rest in God, focus in on him? I mean, just think about the time that he spends on the mountains all, over and over again, right? Right? Spending time with God, spending time even in times together with his disciples, gathering for worship like we have this morning, gathering together in fellowship, Christian fellowship, where, where we're, we're being encouraged, where people are supporting us and, and, and investing in us and our relationship with the Lord. I mean, isn't that what, what he's describing with his life? Time spent alone with God, time, time spent refocusing on God and what he does for me. I mean, this is so important in our life. This is how we prepared for service, isn't it? Isn't this how he prepared for even this time on the cross? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and who went with him? He said, come with me, friends, my disciples. I need you right now, right? And yes, they fell asleep, but he's showing us a pattern, <laughs> When we're going through tough times, we've got to spend time resting in the Lord. Bringing brothers and sisters in Christ with us to pray for us, to encourage us, to support us, right? I mean, that's the life that he's describing. This is how we take care of ourselves. This is how we rest in the Lord. And then, once we do that, we're resting in God's strength to get through this, right? Right? We're resting in God's love so that we might love, right? He fills our cups, and we have an opportunity to, to fill others, right? I mean, that's the life of God. Life, life's not meant to be all about us. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus shows us, even while he's on the cross, he's going through all these horrible things, he can still live a life of purpose and meaning even in the midst of trials. Is our God big enough? <laughs> Can we trust him that much? Now, before we leave this part of the story, there's just something sticking out in the story that I just can't ignore. You know, I kind of have these things that happen to me about scriptures, and I'm going, yeah, but what is this? You ever have those moments when you're reading scripture, and I just never noticed that piece before, and why is it there? Well, there's this part of the story that just, I never hear people talking about it, but, but it seems to be in there, and it's this whole adoption conversation. You know, Jesus knows a lot about adoption, doesn't he? I mean, he was adopted by his earthly father, right? I mean, he experienced the love and investment of his adoptive father. Um, and even the rest of his siblings, they're just half-brothers, half-sisters, right? They, they, they're born of the same mother, but not the same father. They're, they're of a different family, but they've been brought together into a loving family. I mean, is it any wonder with Jesus' 
experiences that adoption is just a huge part of the Christian faith. Being adopted into the family of God. And through the cross, through Christ, we all are adopted into the same family, aren't we? I mean, in, in his blood, we are blood relatives, right? We may not be natural relatives, but we are certainly blood of the lamb, right, relatives. I mean, think about the irony of the situation in this story as Jesus is providing this way to be adopted into the family of God by his death on the cross, right? Jesus is actually in the middle of that, <laughs> Declaring an adoptive connection between a mother and a son. In the same situation, right? And think about this. Jesus had other brothers. Think, of, think hard about this, actually. He had natural brothers. Brothers by blood, right? He could have. Actually, he should have. Based on the cultural understanding that we have of what he was living in, he should have referred his mother's care to who? To the next in line brother, right? Real blood brother, natural brother. The next oldest son should have taken responsibility to care of the mother. And yet we have this amazing <laughs> situation and I would say statement by Jesus that says, John, you may not be blood brother, but you are blood brother. You ever heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water? Well, which is thicker? Your own blood or the blood of the lamb? I mean, this, this is a very interesting question that Jesus is raising here. <laughs> How important is our relationships in the family of God? I mean, he's certainly raising those levels, isn't he? This adoptive family in Christ. How important is it? Our church family is important, according to Jesus. <laughs> he's even saying, hinting at least, that it his church family might even be superior than his blood relatives. Now, don't understand me here. You, you have to read the whole story of the Bible, right? You can't just take one passage and look at it. You've got to look at the whole thing. And, and truly, our mission, our first mission, has always got to be our families, our natural families. If we're serving God and other people, but we're neglecting our elderly relatives, if we're neglecting our own kids, I mean, we need to reevaluate our lives, really. I mean, just one of the verses that talks about this in Scripture is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. It says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? We need to take care of our blood relatives. But we also just can't ignore the emphasis of Jesus on the church family. We just can't ignore it. We have way too many examples of Scripture talking about this. Earlier on in 1 Timothy 5, from the, past, the chapter we just read from, we see Paul encouraging Timothy in the relationships that he has in the church. And listen to the way he describes it. In verse 1, he says, I Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, your younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. I mean, do you see the the description of what our relationship should be like here. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 48, he, he replied, to the, replied to him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, right? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I mean, there's just no way to get away from this high view with the family of God in Scripture. You just can't get there. We are adoptive brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers here. Our connection in Christ, just as with Mary and John's relationship that he's describing while he's on the cross, is more powerful than blood. Think about that for a minute. We are connected together. 
through Christ. <laughs> Therefore, we need each other, don't we? We need each other. I need you to rest in God so that you can invest in me, right? You need me to rest in God so that I don't have to focus completely on me, right? That's why we rest in God, so that I can invest in you. I mean, we're in this together, right? And our world needs us, all of us, to be resting in God so that we can give up our selfish preoccupation with ourselves and invest in them, love them, give attention to their needs so that one day they will become brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers part of our family, right? Living into the purposes of God. I mean, it's a beautiful picture, really. So this morning, will you rest in God? Will you, would you trust him to provide for your needs so that you can invest in others, invest in their needs? Would you pray with me? Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity for us to spend time in your word. Your word is just amazing and so challenging. Lord God, I'm so thankful to be a part of a church family that loves each other, that invests in each other. I see it every day. We have an amazing church family. Lord God, would you help us as a church family to continue in that work? Would you help us to continue to trust in you, trusting that you have our backs so that we could truly just rest in the fact that if we invest in others, you're going to take care of us. Lord, would you help us to trust in you this morning? We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we read our benediction passage this morning, would you just stand with me as we close? And I would encourage you, if you are a member of the church and are planning on voting, if you just hang out in here a little bit, there'll be some people passing out ballots, which will save us some time um, after, afterwards. So let me just read just, I mean, there's just tons of passages that we could read on this topic. But in Galatians chapter 6, it says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whatever, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. As you go from this place this week, I just encourage you to invest in people. Invest in your church family. Invest in those around you. Be the church this week. You are sent.